Hey, everybody. Welcome back to CAF's Heroes of Sport. My name is Bob Abbott, co-founder of Challenge Athletes Foundation. Every week, we get to chat with one of our amazing challenge athletes from around the world. This week, we get to chat with three-time Paralympic gold medalist, Kendall Gretsch, getting ready to go to her second Winter Paralympic Games in beautiful Beijing. How are you doing, Kendall? I'm good. How are you doing, Bob? I am wonderful. So uh, this, uh, this year has to be a whirlwind. You know, going to the summer games in Tokyo and then immediately, how long was it from the end of the summer games till you were back on the snow getting, trying to get ready for Beijing? Yeah, um, I got back on snow beginning of December. So, uh, or sorry, November. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it, it was maybe like a, a month and a half or so, I guess. Sure, um, sure. So yeah, pretty quick turnaround. This is one of the earliest that I've gotten back on snow and um, kind of like full time for the season. So that was really nice just to get some really consistent time. Um, and for you, when did you find out that you were going to, or did they pretty much, did they have a trials or was it a selection? How did that work? Yeah. So our, we didn't have a trials, but it was kind of your performance throughout this season um, determined kind of like selection criteria for the okay. team. Um, so yeah, we just announced the full team a couple days ago. So um, yeah, we're, we're, I guess it's official going to Beijing. And in terms of what will you be competing in? Were you doing a biathlon and the, um, and Nordic? Yeah. So for uh, cross country skiing and biathlon, we have three events each. And then a seventh event is going to be the relay. Um, so yeah, right now I'm planning that I will do all six of the individual events, three for biathlon, three for cross country, and then, um, yeah, potentially the relay as well. Seven events. Yeah. That's a little <laughs> different. You go to triathlon, you got one. Exactly. And now you got seven. That's, yeah. that's amazing. You're going to be busy. Yeah, no, it's definitely, it's definitely a different schedule for sure. Um, but yeah, no, it's exciting to be able to have that many opportunities to race. And um, yeah, that's kind of our typical schedule for World Cups for Nordic skiing, um, where we'll have three, three cross country, three biathlons. So it's definitely a schedule that we're, we're used to competing in. In terms of off snow and, and, and off the triathlon, how do you change your training to go from, you know, from you're doing a hand cycle and racing chair and swimming and then you're Nordic? Uh, is there a huge difference in the way you train? Yeah, so um, I would say like the cardiovascular fitness does translate, but it's really that sport specific strength. So as soon as I started transitioning at the end of the triathlon season, I was doing a lot of work on a ski erg, which is a machine um, that you can set up inside and it mimics the skiing motion. And I am in my sit ski using that. Um, and then, yeah, it, getting on snow is so important. So that's, that's kind of the big step. We'll, we actually went to a camp this year in October to get on snow for a couple of weeks and then, um, yeah, full-time back on snow starting in November. I mean, you had such a, a great background in triathlon, right? Five-time national champion, 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. And when did the Nordic ski come, come into that? Cause at that point, your division wasn't in, in 2016, you guys weren't in the paratriathlon, right? In the Paralympics. Yeah, so it was around that time that I got into skiing. Um, so probably like beginning of 2015 or so, um, that winter is yeah. when I started to get into Nordic skiing. And it was after they made the announcement of what classes were gonna be included in Rio. Um, and when uh, the wheelchair class wasn't included, that's when I started, started getting into Nordic skiing. I, um, went to my first camp, um, I think either that winter or maybe the winter of 2016. Um, and yeah, so started thinking about Nordic skiing as a route to be able to go to the, go to the Paralympics and um, keep doing an endurance sport. So and when did you find out that, okay, in 2020, my division is going to be in the Paralympics? Yeah, I think that announcement came right after the, the actually the winter game. So I remember being in 
Korea and people were asking about whether I was gonna be competing in Tokyo. And at that point, we still didn't know the classifications. So I think it was later, later that spring or summer of 2018 that we found out for sure that the wheelchair class is gonna be included in Tokyo. And when you go to your first Paralympics and you come away with two golds, you know, people uh, obviously just getting to the games is a pretty big deal, but coming away with two goals, how did that change your world? How did, how did it change your life? Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, it was really unexpected. Um, and so, yeah, I think it just kind of solidified for me that Nordic skiing was something that I really wanted to keep pursuing and pursue for another four years. Um, yeah, going into Pyeongchang, I, I was still so new to skiing. And so I really wanted to have the opportunity to train for full year or full four year quad um, before a game. So, so now I'm really excited going into Beijing because I've had that experience and um, yeah, I just feel a little bit more, more comfortable in the sport. And um, so excited to see, see what I can do at this games. So when you come away with two golds from your first Paralympics and you're competing in seven events, people start going, oh, let's see. Now, what are your goals for, for this particular games? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be, it's going to be tough. Um, that's for sure. Like, I think the field has really gotten, um, I guess, expanded and <laughs> just the way um, the course is set up. I think it's, it's going to play to a lot of people's strengths. Um, so I think they're going to be some really competitive races. And I think the other thing that's a little bit of an unknown at this point is um, we haven't been able to compete against any of the athletes from China so far. Um, and we know that they're going to have a really strong team. So, so yeah, I definitely, I would like to be able to, to medal in all my individual events, but um, yeah, I guess I don't know how realistic that is, but but yeah, that's, that's kind of my goal. Um, but yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. So for the base, so do you know what the Beijing courses are going to be? Do they send out a little topo map on that and let people know? Yeah. So typically we would have a test event the year before the games, right? Um, but because of COVID that didn't happen. Um, so we've seen video of the courses, but it's hard to tell from the video, you know, exactly what do the climbs look like and, um, you can get somewhat of a sense, but you don't, we won't really know until we get there. So, um, yeah, I have some idea of what the courses are going to be like, but really looking forward to, to getting there in a few weeks and being able to see it in person. How do you compare your two, uh, Paralympic experiences? One was, you know, pre COVID and then you're dealing with, with COVID having the delay, the, the delay from 2020 to 2021, did you think that helped you hurt you or didn't make a difference? Yeah, I, you know, I think it helped me um, just having that extra year. I'd gotten some new equipment um, at the end of 2019. And so having that extra year gave me more time to use that equipment and kind of train with that. And um, yeah, kind of having that year off without any racing, I was able to focus on some things that I, I normally wouldn't do in a triathlon season because you're you're focused on the race calendar and, and right. have your goals around that. So, so yeah, for me, I think the year off was really beneficial. Um, yeah, the experience of the games is definitely different with COVID, you know, no spectators are there. Um, I think especially for Beijing, it's going to be, be pretty, pretty locked down and in, in a closed system with, with COVID, but you know, if that's what we need to do to keep everyone safe and be able to compete, that's, that's the most important thing is just being able to have that opportunity. So in 2019, you get second at the Worlds to Lauren Parker. And so go knowing that uh, as you're headed into 2020, she was going to be a factor. Did that, sometimes when you have somebody who could become a rival, that's sort of fun. Gives you something to focus on. Definitely. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that that's such a big motivation as an athlete. Like you want someone that's pushing you. Um, to be better. And so, so yeah, when you have that, that great competitor, you, yeah, you're training harder and um, yeah, that's, that's kind of best case scenario, I think. So when I look at the races I've covered and watched over the last 40 years, the race you and Lauren had on that day was just because one second apart after that, that just shows you that who's ever coming up with the factor 
in terms of the time difference is pretty darn good. <laughs> yeah, you guys basically came to the line together. Uh, the you guys start how far you were like over four minutes behind at the start, right? You you start with a handicap of four minutes. Or yeah, so. just just over four minutes, four minutes and four seconds. So, um, yeah, it it seems like a long time when you're just sitting there and waiting, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, and then, so now you're pretty much racing blind, right? You know, you're not seeing you're, are, are you getting splits? So you have a sense of, okay, I'm gaining or I'm not gaining. Yes. Yeah. So we had coaches that were along the course. Um, there was like a designated coaching area. And so when, whenever you pop past that spot, it was on both the run and the bike courses. So they were able to give me splits then. So yeah, I wasn't, I, even though I couldn't see Lauren in front of me, I was able to get that information and, and understand like, okay, I'm actually gaining the time that I need to be in order, you know, to be able to, to make it possible to catch her by the end. And were there thoughts going through your head and going into that last lap, man, I don't know if I can do this. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the beginning of the last lap was the very first time that I saw her like in front of me on the road. And so you know, that's, that's a moment where you're like, okay, you know, like maybe it's going to be possible. Um, and then, yeah, kind of as the rest of that lap played out, it, you know, there was still a gap and I wasn't sure I was, you know, I was like, I could very well run out of space here to be yeah. able to catch her. And so, um, yeah, kind of all the different thoughts <laughs> throughout that lap. But that most exciting race you've ever had? Yeah, definitely in triathlon. That's the closest race I've ever had. And, um, yeah, definitely a, a cool experience and a fun race to be a part of for sure. It's funny when you have a race like that, it's not like it goes away. You guys are linked forever. Yeah. Whenever people talk about great races like Mark Allen and Dave Scott or who, whatever great race you you've seen over the years, they're going to be talking about you and Lauren Parker. Have you guys chatted? Have you guys ever chatted about the race between each other? Uh, yeah, a little bit. We have. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's really cool to be a part of a race that that is like that. It's, you know, kind of a iconic moment. And I hope that, you know, it raises more awareness about paratriathlon within the Paralympic movement and beyond that, and hopefully bring more people in and get them excited about paratriathlon. So you can just keep growing, growing the sport. And the goal is after Beijing, are we thinking Paris? Yes. Yeah, that's definitely the goal for me, I think. You know, Tokyo was such a great experience for me with um, obviously the race and then having my teammates there and coaches there. But I really want to be able to do a race um, at the Paralympics where my family can be there. So hopefully Paris will be that race. When you're a kid growing up with spina bifida, I, was there ever a thought early on? Well, I, I'm just going to go be a prof I'm going to be a professional athlete. I'm going to go out and and find sports that I love and I'm going to travel the world. If somebody told you back then you're going to be a multiple time gold medalist. What would you have said? Yeah, no, that was definitely not any thought that I had when I was growing up. I really didn't learn, I guess, the full extent of what the Paralympics were until I was in college. And so growing up, I, I loved watching the Olympics and I was obsessed with watching the Olympics, but I, I didn't know anything about the Paralympics. And so um, finding out about the Paralympics and what it was, and just really getting a full understanding of what it was when I was in college was such an eye opener for me and really a life changing experience because now my my whole life kind of revolves around, you know, traveling for a sport year round um, and competing. It's, you know, it's my full time job right now. I'm, yeah. I'm training full time. So so it's crazy to think about how much things have changed. So I think it was your first time you were at our San Diego Triathlon Challenge in October. Yeah. And had you and Lauren were honored on stage for really the performance of the year. Did you enjoy yourself that weekend? It's it's for people who haven't been before, it's it's pretty eye-opening. Yeah, no, it's such a cool weekend. I think, you know, obviously the standout is just the kids that are there. I mean, I don't think you'll ever be in a spot where you have so many kids that are just like having fun, doing sport, running around. Um, so so it's a cool weekend to be a part of and experience and um, really just realize you know what what's possible and and how all these kids are having an opportunity to get involved in Paris sport at such a young age which is awesome to see. 
Speaking of young age, one of the women who just made the team, 18-year-old Lyra Doderline, who you know very well, uh, I'm sure that she's going to be going into this going, oh, my God, this is a little different than anything I've ever done before. She didn't even know there were sports out there until she was, you know, after she had her legs amputated. What type of, have you chatted with her a little bit about what she's in for and, and what to be cautious about? Because sometimes it's, it's hard going to, to a, the most important event and sport, sporting event in the world. Yeah, you know, I think it's really cool. Lyra is still so young. Um, and, and so going to her first game at such a, a young age really can just be about the experience and taking it in and, you know, having fun and, um, yeah, kind of, I guess, scoping things out for your first time. And then, you know, using that experience to kind of build upon that for, you know, any sort of future games that she might go to. So, so yeah, it's exciting to have kind of that young energy on the team, um, and, uh, yeah, kind of experience her first Paralympics. Um, fresh okay. eyes, I guess. Kendall, look out for her over there. We're expecting <laughs> you to. <laughs> you can be the mother hen for her. Yeah, no, she's kind of she's she doesn't need too much <laughs> help. She's a, she's very independent. So yes, um, no, it will be exciting. Love it. Kendall, congratulations on the three gold so far. Have a great time in Beijing, and thanks so much for uh, for joining us on CAF's Heroes of Sport. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. Kendall Gretsch has been our guest, everybody. Again, this is our CF Heroes of Sport. Hope everybody tunes in next time. See ya.